As stated at the end of the last lesson, the book of Acts has ended now. But I want to continue my teaching on the book of Acts, even though technically we're not in the book of Acts, for the rest of Paul's life and the books that were written in the New Testament. So let's keep on going. Acts is written about 64 AD, which is about 33 years after the death of Jesus. Tradition says Paul was then released from prison at the end of the book of Acts, and he did extensive traveling in 64 AD. He went from Rome. Early traditions say that he at least went to Spain, but it also may be all the way up into England and then has returned to Asia Minor. While there, he will write the first letter to Timothy. Now, we actually think it's probably the second letter because it talks about my previous letter, about 66 A.D. He's going to write this letter from Philippi in Asia Minor. Date is 66 A.D. It's written to Timothy, who's now uh, ruling, pastoring a church. The purpose, the worship and organization of the church. As an outline, first it starts with a salutation, then the church and its message in the first chapter, the teaching of sound doctrine, the preaching of glorious gospel, the defending of the faith. Then in the second and third chapter, it talks about its members in the church and how it's organized, praying for men, for rulers, for sinners, modest women, modest women in dress, in behavior, dedicated officers, pastors, deacons, behaving believers, and then it goes to the church and its minister in the fourth chapter. What a good minister is, a godly minister, a growing minister, and then the church and its ministry to older saints, to widows, to church leaders, and to servants and slaves, to troublemakers, and to the rich, to the educated. Paul starts off with a salutation. I, Paul, am an apostle on special assignment for Christ, our living hope. Under God, our survey. Savior's command, I'm writing this to you, Timothy, my son in the faith. All the best from our God and Christ be yours. Then he starts in. On my way to the province of Macedonia, I advise you to stay in Ephesus. Well, I haven't changed my mind. Stay right there on top of things so that the teaching stays on track. Apparently, some people have been introducing fantasy stories and fantasyful family trees that digress into silliness instead of pulling the people back into the center, deepening faith and obedience. The whole point of what we're urging is simply love. Love, uncontaminated by self-interest and counterfeit faith. A life open to God. Those who fail to keep to this point soon wander off into cul-de-sacs of gossip. They set themselves up as experts on religious issues, but haven't the remotest idea of what they're holding forth with such imposing eloquence. It's true that moral guidance and counsel need to be given, but the way you say it and to whom you say it are as important as what you say. It's obvious, isn't it, that the law code isn't primarily for people who live responsibly, but for the irresponsible who defy all authority, riding roughshod over God, life, sex, truth, er, whatever. They are contemptuous of the great message I've been put in charge of by this great God. I'm so grateful to Jesus Christ for making me adequate to do this work. He went out on a limb, you know, entrusting me with this ministry. The only credentials I brought to it were invective and witch hunts and arrogance. But I was treated mercifully because I didn't know what I was doing. 
didn't know who I was doing it against. Grace mixed with faith and love poured over me and into me, and all because of Jesus. Here's a word you can take to heart and depend on. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I'm proof, public sinner number one, of someone who could never have made it apart from the mercy and how he shows me off evidence of the endless patience to those who are right on the edge of trusting him forever. What Paul is saying here is, is that he has, was a sinner. We're all sinners. None of us are worthy of having salvation. But God in his mercy and in his grace has given it to us anyway through his son Jesus Christ. Paul says he may have been one of the worst of all of them. I mean, he attacked the church. He destroyed and killed Christians. He literally uh, stood there while Stephen was stoned to death. But God still trusted him, chose him, gave him grace to do this ministry. Let's keep on. Deep honor and bright glory to the king of all times, one God, immortal, invisible, ever and always. Oh, yes. I'm passing this work on to you, my son, Timothy. The prophetic word that was directed to you prepared us for this. All those prayers are coming together now, so you will do this well, fearless in your struggle, keeping a firm grip on your faith and on yourself. After all, this is a fight we're in. There are some, you know, who by relaxing their grip and thinking everything goes, has made it through thorough mess of their faith. Hermenides and Alexander are two of them. I let them wander off to Satan to be taught a lesson or two about not blaspheming. Some of us say, well, we're doing so great on our faith, we'll just kind of let it flow. I've known several preachers who have thought they were doing so much for God that he'd overlook a few of their sins. And you know what? They fail mightily. Let's keep going on. First thing I want you to do is pray. Pray every way you know how. For everyone you know, pray especially for rulers and their governments to rule well so that we can be quietly about our business of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. Paul says pray for the government. Now, realize people say, well, what if I have an evil government? At the time Paul is writing this, they are under occupation by the Romans who are the government over them. They are uh, basically slaves in many ways. But he says, pray for that government. Why? Because it will keep the peace, and then we can go about doing our work. He wants not only us, but everyone saved. You know, everyone to get to know the truth we've learned, that there's one God and only one, and one priest meditator between God and us, Jesus who offered himself in exchange for everyone held captive by sin to set them all free. Eventually the news is going to get out. This and this only has been my appointed work, getting this news to those who have never heard of God and explaining how it works by simple faith and plain truth. Since prayer is at the bottom of all this, what I am want mostly is for men to pray, not shaking angry fisted enemies but raising holy hands to God. Did you get that last? Not shaking angry-fisted enemies, but raising holy hands to God. What Paul is saying here is, to me anyway, that sometimes we are so busy condemning others that we're not praising God. We're not praying for our enemies. Pray that God will show them the light. Pray that God will uh, help them to find the good in life. Pray that God will bless them so much that they'll have to accept the fact that he is there. If we do that, then we need not condemn them. And I want women to get in there with the men. In humility before God, not primping before a mirror or chasing the latest fashions, but doing something beautiful for God and becoming beautiful doing it. 
and that beautifulness is in prayer. I don't let women take over and let, tell the men what to do. They should study to be quiet and obedient along with everyone else. Adam was made first, then Eve. Woman was deceived first, our pioneer in sin, with Adam right on her heels. On the other hand, her childbearing brought about salvation, reversing Eve. But this salvation only comes to those who continue in faith, love, and holiness, gathering it all together into maturity. You can depend on this. And I still have not understand that childbearing brought about salvation. I'm assuming that's because she gave birth to Jesus. If anyone wants to provide leadership in the church, good. But there are preconditions. A leader must be well thought of, committed to his wife, cool, collected, accessible, and hospitable. He must know what he's talking about, not be over-fond of wine, not pushy but gentle, not thin-skinned, not money-hungry. He must handle his own affairs well, attentive to his own children, having their respect. For if someone is unable to handle his own affairs, how can he take care of God's church? We must not be a new believer. Least the physician go to his head and the devil trip him up. Outsiders must think well of him, or else the devil will figure out a way to lure him into a trap. So, how does this fit for the leaders that are in your church? Well thought of, committed to his wife, cool, collected, accessible, hospitable, knows what he's talking about, not over fond of wine, not pushy but gentle, not th thin-skinned, not money-hungry. Handle his affairs well. The same goes for those who want to be servants in the church. These is deacons. Serious, not deceitful, not too free with the bottle, not in it for what they can get out of it. You must be reverent before the mystery of the faith, not using their position to try and run things. Let them prove themselves first. If they show that they can do it, take them on. No exceptions are to be made for women. Same qualifications, serious, dependable, not sharp-tongued, not over-fond of wine. Servants in the church are to be committed to their spouses, attentive to their own children, and diligent in looking after their own affairs. Those who do this work, servant work, will come to be highly respected in real credit to this Jesus faith. The word servant here is what usually is translated deacon in Baptist churches and other churches. I hope to visit you soon. But just in case I'm delayed, I'm writing this letter so you'll know how things ought to go in God's household. It's God Alive Church, Bastion of Truth. This Christian life is a great mystery, far exceeding our understanding. But some things are clear enough. He appeared in a human body was proved right by the invisible spirit, was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among all kinds of peoples, believed in all over the world, taken up into glory, heavenly glory. Paul says there are certain things here that are very important to understand, that he did have a human body. There are people at that time teaching he is just a spirit, and it floated through life and never really physically suffered. It also says that he was given right, proved right by the invisible spirit. The spirit working in Jesus helped him do the miracles that he did. That he was seen and proclaimed by many witnesses. Not just one or two. And now he's being believed in around the whole world. And finally he was taken up into glory. So he has a physical bodily resurrection. And we need to remember all of these things or important. The Spirit makes it clear to me in times go on. Some are going to go up on faith and chase after demonic, give up on faith and chase after demonic illusions put forth by professional liars. These liars have lied so well and for so long that they've lost their capacity for truth. They'll tell you not to get married. They'll tell you not to eat this or that food, perfectly good food God created to be eaten heartily and with thanksgiving by believers who know better. Everything God created is good and to be received with thanks, 
Nothing is to be sneered at or thrown out. God's word and our prayers make every item in creation holy. You've been raised on the message of faith and have followed sound teaching. Now pass on this counsel to the followers of Jesus there, and you'll be a good servant of Jesus. We have people still going around. From his previous letters, we know there were people that are called Judaizers. They're basically telling people you have to be circumcised. You have to eat uh, certain foods. You have to basically become a Jew, and then you can become a Christian. Paul says, malarkey. They're lying to you. Don't let them lie. All you have to do, wherever you're at, Whoever you are, however evil you are, however good you are, however Gentile you are, however Jewish you are, is believe in Jesus by faith. Let's go on. Stay clear of silly stories that get dressed up as religion. Exercise daily in God. No f spiritual flabbiness, please. Work out in the gym are useful, but a disciplined life in God is far more so, making you fit both today and forever. You can count on this. Take it to heart. This is why we've thrown ourselves into this venture so totally. We're banking on the living God, Savior of all men, and women, especially believers. Get the word out. Teach all these things, and don't let anyone put you down because you're young. We need to work out in our spiritual gym as well as our physical body. The spiritual gym is prayer. It's meditation. It's reading God's word. It's praising God, listening to Christian music. Do you do these things to build up your muscles, so to speak, in Christ? Teach believers with your life. What Paul is saying here is live a life that shows Jesus. Many people will listen to a sermon, but most people would much rather see a sermon. How do you do this? By word. Every word you say is important. Words carry power. By your demeanor. By your love. By your faith. By your integrity. Stay at your post reading scripture, giving counsel, teaching. And that special gift of ministry you were given when the leaders of the church laid hands on you and prayed, keep that dusted off and in use. Let's stop here just a minute. If you were a Christian, if you have asked Jesus into your heart, if the Holy Spirit has come into your heart, then you have gifts of ministry to share with others. Each one of us is gifted differently. I feel I'm gifted in praying, preaching, and teaching. Others are gifted in other ways. But note that you have gifts. Now, you may not use them or you may not know what they are, but you have gifts, and God expects you to use them. They help other people. Going on. Cultivate these things. Immerse yourself in them. The people will see your mature right before their eyes. Keep a firm grasp on both your character and your teaching. Don't be diverted. Just keep at it. Both you and those who hear you will experience salvation. Don't be harsh or impatient with an older man. Take him Talk to him as you would your father and to the younger men as your brothers. Reverently honor an older woman as you would your mother and your younger women as sisters. Take care of widows who are destitute. And if a widow has a member, family member to take care of her, let them learn the religion begins in their own doorstep and that they should pay back with gratitude some of what they have received. This pleases God immensely. You can tell a legitimate widow by the way she has put all her hope in God, praying to him constantly for the needs of others as well as for her own. But a widow who exploits people's emotions and pocketbooks, well, there's nothing to her. Tell these things to the people so that they will do the right thing in their extended family. Anyone who neglects to care for family members in need repudiates the faith. That's worse than refusing to believe in the first place. Sign some widows up for the special ministry of offering assistance. They will in turn receive support from the church. They must be over 60, married only once, and have a reputation for helping out with children, strangers, tired Christians, and hurt and troubled. What he's wanting them to do is to sign up these women to actually be paid to do ministry and to be use, reaching out to others. And they got to be at least 60. That's pretty old. Uh, at that time, 30 or 40 was uh, a pretty old person, too. 
Don't put young widows on this list. No sooner will they get on than they will want to get off, obsessed with wanting to get a husband rather than serving Christ in this way. By breaking their word, they're liable to go from bad to worse, frittering away their days on empty talk, gossip, and trivialities. No, I'd rather the young w- widows go ahead and get married in the first place, have children manage their homes, and not give critics any foothold for finding fault. Some of them have already left and gone after Satan. Any Christian woman who has widows in her family is responsible for them. They should be dumped, should, shouldn't be dumped on the church. The church has its hands full already with widows who need help. Give a bonus to leaders who do a good job, especially the ones who work hard at preaching and teaching. Scripture tells us, don't muzzle a working ox. Our workers deserve his pay. Don't listen to a complaint against a leader that isn't backed up by two or three responsible witnesses. Just because one person tells you somebody did something doesn't mean they actually did it. Maybe they have an axe to grind. Make sure you know what's going on. If anyone falls into sin, call that person on the carpet. Those who are inclined that way will know right off they can't get by with it. God and Jesus and angels all back me up on these instructions. Carry them out without favoritism, without taking sides. Don't appoint people to the church leadership positions too hastily. If a person is involved in some serious sin, you don't want to become an unwitting accomplice. In any event, keep a close check on yourself and don't worry too much about what the critics will say. Go ahead and drink a little wine, for instance. It's good for your digestion, good medicine for your ails you. The sins of some people are blatant and march them right into court. The sins of others don't show up until much later. The same with good deeds. Some you see right off, but none are hidden forever. Now, go back up here to a person who falls into sin should be called on the carpet. That's one thing we don't do in the church today. How many times do we take somebody who has, for instance, committed adultery and call them on the carpet at the church? But if we let sinners live amongst us, will people start to think we condone it? Whoever is a slave must make the best of it, Give respect, giving respect to the master so that the outsiders don't blame God in our teaching for his behavior. Slaves with Christian masters are all the more so. Their masters are really their beloved brothers. Some people think here that Paul is condoning slavery. I don't think so. What he's saying is, is it's an institution we have. Some people are slaves. I think today he would have probably said workers. Work for your bosses. How are we to work? In such a way that nobody can say anything against us. We're to do the best possible we can. Why? Because we're representing Jesus Christ. And people are going to judge our master, Jesus, about how we treat others. These are the things I wanted to teach you and preach. If you have leaders who... Teach otherwise, who refuse the solid words of our Master Jesus in this godly instruction, tag them for what they are, ignorant windbags who infect the air with germs of envy, controversy, bad-mouthing, suspicious rumors. Eventually, there's an epidemic of backstabbing and truth is but a distant memory. They think religion is a way to make a fast buck. A devout life does bring wealth. Notice that. A devout life does bring wealth. But it's rich. It's the rich simplicity of being yourself before God. Since we entered the world penniless and will leave it penniless, if we have bread on the table and shoes on our feet, that's enough. I'm going to stop here in a second. John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodism, said that a, re- a revival cannot long last. Because when a revival comes and God gets into the spirit, people start becoming wealthy. They start watching how they spend their money. They start watching how they live. And as they become more wealthy, they become more distracted by that wealth and will eventually slow down and end the revival. We need to be careful. As he said, bread on the table and shoes on your feet, that's enough. Do you have enough? When is enough enough in our lives? I've had some people say, well, enough. I have enough now. So if I ever get a raise again, I'm going to give every bit of it away uh, to my church or to others. 
I'm going to live from the level that I'm living right now because I'm happy. But others, we always want a little bit more. You know, the richest man in the world was once asked, how much is enough? And he says, more, a little bit more than I have. And that's the way we often are. But if it's only a member, money, let's start again, but if it's only money, these peop leaders are after, they'll self-destruct in no time. Just for money th brings trouble and nothing but trouble. Going down that path, some lose their footing in the faith completely and live to regret it bitterly ever after. But you, Timothy, man of God, run your life from all this. Pursue a righteous life, a w life of wonder, faith, love, steadfast courtesy, run hard and fast in the faith, seize the eternal life and the life you called to, the life you so reverently embraced in the presence of so many witnesses. I'm charging you before the life-giving God and before Christ who took his stand before Pontius Pilate and didn't give an inch. Keep this command to the letter and don't slack off. Our Master Jesus Christ on his way is on his way. He'll show up right on time. His arrival guaranteed by the blessing and undisputed ruler, high king and high God. He's the only one death can't touch. He's light so bright no one can get close. He's never been seen by human eyes. Human eyes can't take him in. Honor to him and eternal rule. Oh, yes. Tell those rich in this world's wealth to quit being so full of themselves and so obsessed with money which is here today and gone tomorrow. Tell them to go after God who piles on all the riches we could ever manage to do good, to do, be rich in helping others to be extravagantly generous. If they do that, they'll build a treasure that will last gaining life that is truly life. And oh, my dear Timothy, guard the treasure you've been given. Guard it with your life. Avoid the talk show religion and the practice confusion of so-called experts. God caught up in a lot of talk can people caught up in a lot of talk can miss the whole point of faith. Overwhelming grace keep you. And with this, this letter to Timothy has ended. We now move to the next book. And Paul writes to Titus in about 65 A.D. Authors, Paul, most likely he writes it from Corinth, but we're not sure. It's much argued about the date, but most likely between the first and second imprisonment in Rome, so about 65 A.D. It's written to Titus, representing Paul in Crete. So Titus is there to represent Paul in Crete. He's one of the leaders in the church there. So this is a personal letter to a personal person. Purpose to raise hopes by pointing the way to life without end. The outline has an introduction, ordaining qualified elders, rebuke false teachers, speak sound doctrine, maintain God good works, and then a conclusion. So it's a fairly short letter, not many verses. Let's get into it. I, Paul, am God's slave and Christ's agent for promotion in the faith among God's chosen people. Getting out the accurate word on God and how to respond rightly to it. My aim is to praise, raise hopes by pointing the way of life without end. This is the life God promised long ago and he doesn't break promises. And then, when the time was ripe, he went public with this truth. He's been entrust, I've been entrusted to proclaim this message by order of our Savior God himself. Dear Titus, legitimate son in the faith, receive everything God our Father and Jesus our Savior give you. I left you in charge of Crete so that you can complete what I left half done. Appoint leaders in every town according to my instructions. As you select them, ask is this man well thought of? Is he committed to his wife or his children believers? Do they respect him and stay out of trouble? It's important that a church leader responsible for the affairs of God's house be looked up to, not pushy, not short-tempered, not drunk, not a bully, not money-hungry. We must welcome people, be helpful, wise and fair, reverent, have a good grip on himself, and have a good grip on the message. Knowing how to use the truth is 
to either spur people on in truth and knowledge or stop them in their tracks if they oppose them. These are about the same uh, qualifications for elders or pastors that was given to Timothy, if you notice. There's a lot of rebels out there full of loose, confusing, and deceiving talk. Those who are brought up religious and ought to know better are the worst. They've got to be shut up. They're disrupting entire families with their teaching, and all for the sake of a fast book. One of their own prophets said it best, the Cretans are liars from the womb, barking dogs, lazy bellies. I certainly spoke the truth. He certainly spoke the truth. But get on them right away. Stop these diseased talk of Jewish make-believe and made-up rules so that they can recover a robust faith. Everything is clean and clean-minded. Nothing is clean in the dirty-minded believers. They leave their dirty fingerprints on every thought and act. They say they know God, but their actions speak louder than their words. They're real creeps, disobedient, good-for-nothings. Your job is to speak out on the things that make for solid doctrine. Guide older men into lives of temperance, dignity, and wisdom, into healthy faith, love, and endurance. Guide older women into lives of reverence so that they end up as neither gossips nor drunks, but models of goodness. By looking at them, the younger women will know how to love their husbands and children. Be virtuous and pure. Keep a good house. Be good wives. We don't want anyone looking down on God's message because of their behavior. Also guide the young men to live disciplined lives. But mostly show them all this by doing it yourself. Incorruptible in your teaching, your words solid and sane. Then anyone is who is dead set against us, when he finds nothing weird or misguided, might eventually come around. In other words, he tells Titus like he told Timothy. Live out what you say, and people will listen to you. Lastly, guide slaves into being loyal workers, a bonus to their masters. No back talk, no petty thievery. Then their good character will shine through their actions, adding luster to the teachings of our Savior God. God's readiness to give and forgive is now public. Salvation available for everyone. Notice, salvation is available for everyone. Doesn't mean everyone's going to accept it, but it is given so anybody, no matter how evil or how good or bad you are, you need it. We're being shown how to turn our backs on the godless, indulgent life, and how to take on a God-filled, God-honored life. This new life is starting right now and is whetting our appetite for glorious days when our great God and Savior Jesus Christ appears. Note again, stop, just a side note, the life has begun right now. Eternal life is not living forever. Everybody is going to live forever. Some in heaven and some in hell. But we're all going to live forever. Eternal life is a quality of life that starts right now when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Keep it on. He offered himself as a sacrifice to free us from a dark, rebellious life into this good, pure life, making us a people who can be proud of, energetic, and goodness. Tell them all this. Build up their courage and discipline them if they get out of line. You're in charge. Don't let anyone put you down. Remind the people to expect the government and to be lawful abiding, always ready to lend a helping hand. No insults, no fights. God's people should be big-hearted and courteous. It wasn't so long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn, dupes of sin, ordered every which way by our glands, going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating it back. But when God, our kind and loving Savior God, stepped in, he saved us with all that. It was all his doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath and came out of it a new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift was restored, our relationship with him, and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come, an eternity of life. You can count on this. I want you to put your foot down. Take a firm stand on what matters so that those who have put their trust in God will concentrate on the essentials that are good for everyone. Stay away from mindless, pointless quarreling over genealogies and fine print in the law code. That gets you nowhere. 
warn a quarrelsome person once or twice, but then be done with him. It's obvious that such a person is out of line, rebellious against God. By persisting in divisiveness, he cuts himself off. As soon as you send either Artemis or Tychius to you, I, as soon as I send either Artemis or Tychius to you, come immediately and meet me in Nicopolis. I've decided to spend the winter here. Give Zenos the lawyer and Apollos a hearty send-off. Take good care of them. Our people have to learn to be diligent in their work so that all necessities are met, especially among the needy. And they don't end up with nothing to show for their lives. All here want to be reminded to say, you say hello to my friends in the faith, grace to you all. And this ends the letter of Titus. Next, we come to Peter's writing in First and Second Peter, about 65 A.D. We're not going to delve too deeply into these. In First Peter, it's written by Peter the Apostle, I believe. Some people argue about that. Written from Babylon on the Euphrates River, it says. Date about 65 A.D. is written to the strangers scattered abroad. In other words, the Jews of the dispersion that are scattered away from the nation of Israel. Purpose is to confirm its readers in the doctrines they have been already taught. Let's look at an outline real quick. The outline is the salutation, prayer for thanksgiving, thanks for a new life, rejoice in the difficult situations, Old Testament support for the Christian message. Then he talks about the Christian life and Holiness of God is the foundation of the Christian life. Sacrifice of Christ is a reason for proper conduct, proper relationships between believers. Christian community is a new people of God. Then he talks about Christian behavior. How should we live? He talks the introductory words and then his attitude toward government, attitude of servants toward their masters. Christ's example in regard to suffering relationship between husbands and wives, relationships of Christians to one another, further exhortations on Christian conduct, Christian suffering and service, readiness to suffer as a result of obeying Christ, Christian service, further words of encouragement of suffering Christians, admonitions to the church, to the leaders, to the whole church community. And then lastly, concluding greetings and closing blessing. Then Second Peter is written, don't really know from where, about 65 A.D., to the mature Christians. These are Christians who are supposed to uh, be living the Christian life. The purpose is to remind the recipient of the truths of the Christianity. Outline, it has a salvation, salutation rather, a call to live according to God's call. Aim and purpose of the letter talks about the reliability of prophetic message regarding Jesus Christ. False teachers who misinterpret and misuse the prophetic message. Then his Old Testament examples to show that God punishes the wicked and rewards those who are faithful to him. Further description of false teachers. There's the sin of the false teachers. Punishment of false teachers. Then it discusses the perusia, which is the scattering of the people. Statement about the formal letter. Now the perusian reasons for its delay. The ethical implications of the perusian disaster connected with it. The mention of Paul and his letters are supporting the above ideas. Closing doxology. Then we have the writing of the book of Hebrews. Now, the book of Hebrews is very mysterious. We're not really sure when it was written, 66 to 70 A.D. It was written before the destruction of the temple in 60 and 70 A.D. Uh, who wrote it? We don't know. Silas, Paul's companion, maybe Clement of Rome, Barnabas, Apollos. Most likely Paul, some think. So, I mean, it's a wide variety of who wrote this. It's from Rome in 66 to 70 A.D., the Jewish converts to the faith of the gospel, probably for the church in Jerusalem, to show the true end and meaning of the Mosaic system. Now, what it's going to do is, 
it's going to take and show that Jesus is the high priest, and therefore he has replaced the high priest, and all that that we did in the temple. As an introduction, the excellence of Christ, he superior to angels, the author of great salvation, the true man, superior to Moses, then the promised rest is going to have the spiritual basis for it. How Some did not enter the rest. Christians enter the rest. Exhortation to enter the rest. A great high priest for Jesus. He our, has our confidence, the qualities required for high priest. Christ's qualifications as high priest. The danger of apostasy. Failure to progress in the faith. Exhortation to progress. No second beginning. Exhortation to perseverance. God's promise is sure. Then he talks about Melchizedek, who is a very unusual priest in the Old Testament. The greatness of Melchizedek, the royal priesthood of Melchizedek and of Christ. Christ's priesthood superior because of, one, his life, the divine oath, its permanence, a better sacrifice, a new and better covenant has now been made. Christ's more excellent ministry, the old covenant superseded. The old sanctuary and its rituals talked about how they did that. Now the blood of Christ has been placed there, and he's the mediator of this new covenant, the perfect sacrifice, the law of a shadow of what it really was to be true. One sacrifice for sins, and that was Jesus. The sequel, the right way now. Sequel, the wrong way. Choose the right. Then he talks about faith. The meaning of faith. The great men of faith before the flood. The faith of Abraham and Sarah, the faith of the patriarchs, the faith of Moses, the faith of Exodus generation, the faith of other servants of God, the promise that has been given. Then he talks about Christian living. He talks about Christ as our example. Christ, Christian living discipline in our Christian living. Exhortation to the Christian life. Mount Sinai and Mount Zion, how they're different. Mount Sinai, you get the law. Mount Zion, you get to worship God. A kingdom that cannot be shaken. Love, Christian leadership, Christian sacrifice, Christian obedience, talks about prayer, and then has a conclusion. It's a rather long book and really is more for Jewish people to try and convince them that Jesus is the Messiah, the priest. We have a doxology and a final exhortation. And we're going to stop there. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your spirit is with us, blessing us, touching us, and guiding us, that we might be your people and might know your power in our lives. Be with us as we go from this place, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.